Fear. It's something that we all experience at least one time in our lives, and we experience it in many different ways. But for those that experience the feeling repetitively, well, eventually, fear does start to fade. Especially for those that end up playing horror games. For those that play titles in the horror genre, it can become harder and harder to get the same rush of adrenaline continuously. And it doesn't help that most horror games, especially nowadays, are so similar to one another. However, once every so often, a horror game comes along that subverts all expectations, and executes its ideas perfectly. An experience so unique that you can't help but play it from start to finish, all while noticing that long-lost feeling of fear coming back with a vengeance. And that's what we're going to be tackling today. So, sit back, relax, and grab yourself a flashlight, because today we're diving into the depths of a little horror game called It Steve. It Steals was created by a developer known as Zekers, and it started off just being a side project of theirs as they were working on a far larger project at the time. Now It Steals was first released as a far smaller experience that only featured you in a maze collecting orbs, all while trying to hide from a beast named Legs. However, as time continued, the smaller project became known as It Steals Classic, and a far larger game would be created using its bones, as the developer noticed that there was a lot more interest in It Steals than its current project. The full Steam version of the game would be aptly named It Steals, and released on July 22nd of 2020. This title will be split into multiple game modes, and each have different mechanics to them, not to mention unique creatures that are specific to each mode. When the game launched, it was met with praise from all over, and earned the title of the scariest game of 2020. And even today, the game is held in high regard, as it still holds a near 10 out of 10 rating on Steam, and a 4.9 out of 5 on itch.io. This game was designed in a way to subvert and take full advantage of your expectations, making you feel unsure of every move you make during your time with it. And, when you first load up the game, nothing can truly prepare you for the experience that you've just committed to. Loading into the game for the first time, a quick flash of instructions will appear, lightly detailing your controls and objectives. After this, you'll find yourself in a dark, checkered maze, with doors you can't open, writing you can't read, and orbs that litter the halls. You're only armed with a flashlight and a basic objective, collecting the orbs. However, you'll soon notice something that is considered a bit of a staple of its steals, and that's its aesthetic, as this game features your FOV being completely pixelated. Where most horror experiences will only darken the halls to limit your vision, It Steals takes things one step further, as your vision is hampered by jagged pixels that cover the screen. This creates an interesting dynamic visually, as you can't make out fine details, or see things clearly at a distance. And because of this, things can end up running together, which the game does take full advantage of. And this is not just a stylistic choice, as it also does affect gameplay. For anyone that's ever played a game in the horror genre, normally you'll have a limited amount of stamina. But when you try the same thing here in It Steals, you'll see a very big difference, as in It Steals, you have infinite stamina and can run any distance you so choose. However, the longer you run, the more distorted your vision becomes, and it only resets after you cease your running. With all this stacked together, It Steals hits you with a wave of unease unlike any other. But since there's nothing you can do to change your circumstances, unless you're a pleb and go into the settings, all you can do is move forward through the maze and collect your objective. But soon, you'll start to notice something out of the corner of your eye. And eventually... You'll realize you're not alone. This is our introduction to the first major antagonist of its steals. A monster called Legs. A creature with long limbs and a square body with a human-like face spread across it. Its eyes glow red, and he makes his home in the dark corners where you can't see him. He stalks you relentlessly. But unlike monsters in other horror games, he doesn't outright attack you, but rather opting for peeking around corners and coming from behind while you're not looking, before he dashes with incredible speed to damage you. He's a monster that hides from you. He never directly shows himself. It also doesn't help that the pixelization of your FOV gives legs and other entities an added perk of becoming hard to distinguish through the halls and other terrain. This can lead to multiple occurrences where you think the monster is there, but isn't, which can actually cause you to not even trust your own sight. Despite this, you'll have to find a defense against the creature that's stalking you, otherwise you'll end up dead. And through trial and error, or just by basic intuition, you should begin to notice that he'll evade you if you shine your light on him, and this then becomes your salvation. When hearing him approach you, flashing legs will cause him to scamper away, giving you time to move. However, things can't be that easy, as eventually, after enough attempts at trying to catch you, legs will change the game. <laughs>
This is what's known as an enraged state. During this state, his speed is increased, and he is far more aggressive than he was before. And if he catches you, you die. Your only chance to escape is to run through the maze, taking sharp corners all while building distance between you and the creature. Eventually, he should settle down, however, you'll most likely become disoriented as you lose track of your current location when running through the maze trying to lose the entity. And because of this, it'll lead you to the last major mechanic of the game, the radar. The radar acts as sort of like a map, but you'll soon notice that this map barely shows any sort of details in the area, and only gives off a rough laser-like outline of your current space. The best way to describe the way that the radar works is that it more shows anything that emits light and the walls that that light hits. With the only notable thing on the radar to actually worry about is the blue glowing spot which indicates orbs you've missed. But it can't always be trusted, as your radar may show large glowing blue spots, but in fact, it's legs adapting to you trying to bait you into its clutches by pretending to be an orb. Now, you may also be encouraged to run continuously in order to get through the mode in a faster pace, but even then, Ant Steals will punish you for abusing your infinite stamina, as legs will become far more aggressive, and the more you run, it will eventually lead to an early death. Now, after enough time, you should inevitably come across your final orb, and collecting it will play the ending of the current mode. This introduces us to the Phantom. We also now have confirmation that there is no true form of escape, and our only option is to go even deeper into the maze. The next major mode is called Shutter. The most immediate difference you'll notice is that your flashlight has now been replaced with a camera, and that camera has a limited number of shots it can take before its power runs out. The reason for the camera is now legs acts different than before. Where Legs used to try and catch you around corners, he now tries to approach you directly, using the Cloak of Darkness as his cover, since you no longer have the sanctity of the flashlight to protect you. When you hear him slowly approach you, that's your chance to use your camera to flash him. But as noted before, camera flashes are limited, and your batteries will drain from each use. And if your camera runs out of power... ...you'll meet a very quick death. You do at least have one perk in this mode. The orbs act as a bit of a power source, and they will refill your batteries every time you collect one. And with that said, the orbs being a power source is a detail we'll actually need to remember for later, but for now, all you need to know is that they will refill your battery, and that's all that's important. You should also notice that the maze's layout is different from the previous mode, but the objective does stay the same. Collect all the orbs and try and survive. However, after flashing legs enough times during your run, he will eventually enter another enraged state, just like before. This time his speed is increased to an insane level, and your only hope is to flash him in turn to buy time till he calms back down. Aside from that, once you do finally collect the remaining orbs, it will eventually play the ending of Shutter Mode. The ending here is a stark contrast from what we experienced before, as now whimsical music plays in the background as a montage of the photos you've taken begin to show up on screen. Whether this is meant to be funny or not is up for debate, but I personally saw this as uncomfortable. It acted as a reminder, a reminder of how close I was to meeting my end at this creature's hands. This is the third game mode in It Steals, a mode called Hide and Seek, and it's one of the most unique modes in the entire game. And you'll notice very quickly that this mode is nowhere near the same as the ones before. The game will tell you that you're it, and you would think by the title alone that your objective would be to hide. When in reality, you're the Seeker. This then introduces us to the next entity in It Steals, the Hide and Seeker. 
a monster with exaggerated limbs, checkered skin, and sharp fangs, with a twisted smile on its face. Thanks to its skin, it can blend into the background with ease, but unlike all the other monsters, the Seeker will follow the rules of hide and seek. It won't pose an immediate threat until it's found. The monster will hide from you and constantly move throughout the maze to catch you off guard. This type of gameplay creates an interesting dynamic. Finding the monster is the biggest threat, and yet, aside from that, this level seems safe. You can run freely and make as much noise as you want, as long as you're not trying to find the monster. Whether intentional or not, you're going to end up running into this entity more times than you can count. But thankfully, your core objective does stay the same. Collect all the orbs and survive. Now you may ask yourself, what is the best way to actually avoid this creature? Personally, I found it was best to look at the ceiling or the floor, taking my time, and moving somewhat slowly and methodically through the stage. All while making sure to look at my peripheral vision so I don't run into the Seeker. However, if you do end up running into the entity, you'll have 5 seconds to hide. Though hiding will only delay the inevitable, as the creature almost always seems to find you eventually, and when that happens, all you can do is run. But as long as you take your time, you should be able to get all the orbs with little resistance. However, contrary to what you might think, collecting all the orbs without finding the entity may not be the best play. Because in doing so, the Seeker will become... Well, enraged. So, you should be prepared to run. But, once you have obtained your final collectible, you're treated to the ending of the mode. You find yourself entrapped in a room with no way out, as the door across from you is locked and all you can do is bang against it. You'll inevitably be enticed to look around the room, where you'll see the entity in the corner. It'll begin to hum a sadistic tune through its distorted voice, and its body will begin to stretch and contort outwards. And after a few moments, you'll inevitably meet your end. This is the fourth game mode in its steals, titled Living Halls. And when you first start off, you'll notice a major set piece change. Where the other modes have all had you in identical environments, Living Hall starts you off in a vault. Looking at your map, you can see greenish hues in certain locations, which marks other vaults of a similar design. And you're armed with a new device that is strapped to your wrist. As you exit the vault, a timer will begin to count down, and your new device will begin to beep. This mode isn't unlike what you've experienced before, as the creatures in this level are best described in the title itself. The halls are alive. These beasts are called monstrosities. They mimic the walls and hide their form until you get close. They travel in packs and have multiple eyes and spider-like features. And once enraged, they'll move with incredible speed and are extremely dangerous when in groups. Now, do you remember that timer that I mentioned a little bit ago? It's been counting down since the moment you left the first vault. And chances are, during your first run, you weren't paying attention to it. And because of that, your time has most likely ran out. When your timer is up, the monstrosities will become active and charge after you. You can run, but you're only delaying your demise by seconds. This is where the vaults come in. You have a limited amount of time to collect as many orbs as possible, but eventually you'll have to retreat back to a vault in order to survive. When you enter a vault, you'll have to wait while the monstrosities roam free, but from time to time, your device may start emitting screeching noises and showing text, baiting you into opening the vault door. These messages are from the monstrosities themselves, and entertaining these messages will always lead to death. Inevitably, your timer will reset, and you'll be able to exit the vault and make another run. But be warned, the vault you use will become deactivated for the cycle until you've used a different vault. So because of this, you need to constantly be swapping vaults and keeping track of the closest ones to you. Now as always, the main objective does stay the same. Collect orbs when given the chance. But unlike the previous games where there was only one creature to deal with, the more orbs you collect will lead to more monstrosities becoming active. And due to this, it can lead to a very big problem. That problem being the simple fact that with more monstrosities roaming the halls, it can very much easily lead to you becoming cornered. That is, unless you stay mobile. However, running constantly is also ill-advised, as it will enrage the creatures more and more. This all leads to living halls becoming one of the most difficult game modes in its deals. Between having to keep track of your timer, the locations of vaults, how close you are to a vault, what orbs you've collected and which ones you need to end up collecting, keeping track of locations of monstrosities and paying attention to your detection system, there's just so much to keep track of and to deal with in this mode, and it really will test your patience. 
but eventually you'll get a feel for it, and inevitably you'll end up collecting your final orb. Only to realize that the creatures were just toying with you, and you never actually stood a chance. The final mode in this game is the most challenging of all. You're dropped into a maze as usual, but this time it's littered with movable objects that all make audible noises. You're also equipped with two odd devices that can only be placed one at a time. That, after a setup period, will generate an odd green field over a small area. And you're also given the uncomfortable ability to hold your breath. Now, normally the entities in the level would have a physical form. You can hear them from a distance and or they'll introduce themselves rather quickly, all having time to react to them before they become aggressive. However... The Phantom is far different. The Phantom is a blackened creature with no set form or mass. Its body shifts rapidly in size and moves in much the same manner. This is the same creature you were introduced to during the ending of the classic mode, and it is by far the most dangerous out of the lot. In this mode, you and the Phantom are invisible to one another, but along that same vein, just like you, the Phantom can hear you move. Your only form of detection for the creature is the environment around you, as this ghost figure will tear through all the objects, flinging them in all manner of directions, even to the point of blocking certain passages. In order to stay hidden, you'll have to hold your breath while it passes, but you can only do this for a few seconds, so timing is everything. This is not a mode you can just rush. Taking your time and being methodical is key to survival. However, you can only be so careful, and eventually, you'll get caught. This is where the devices come into play. The barriers they create has a one-time repelling effect on the Phantom, so if you're spotted, you'll need to sprint to the device before it can reach you. Once you're in the field, you'll be safe for a moment until the Phantom trips the barrier and disables the device. Now keep in mind, you only have two of these machines, and each of them only have a single use. So you're going to need to be strategic with their placement and not waste them, all while being mindful of your presence to the Phantom and staying hidden as much as possible. Because if you end up using all your devices and get caught without having any kind of defense, It's game over. This all comes together in a game of cat and mouse. Moving slowly through each room and only grabbing orbs when it's safe is your only option. But inevitably, with enough time, you'll collect your final orb and you're put into the final escape sequence. The game will tell you to run and don't look back, and you'll hear the phantom approach you from behind at a rapid pace. Objects will be placed in your path, slowing you down, but just in the distance you can see a beam of light ahead. Escape is finally in your grasp, and right as you're just about to reach it, you realize escape was nothing but a fallacy. This is the final ending to It Steals. You never truly had a chance to escape, and it was only just a matter of time before the creatures in this maze got to you. But even if the ending doesn't end on a victorious note, the game itself is an astonishing experience. The controls feel sharp and snappy, the mechanics are all executed perfectly, the aesthetics of the game is one of a kind, with an amazing sound design to boot. From checkered floor to locked door, this game is perfect, and it will get your heart pumping one way or another. Even on repeat playthroughs, this game still makes me jump from the sound design alone, and not many games can achieve that. Now, with all that said, we have delved into the big bulk of its deals, but you'd be wrong if you didn't think this game had more hiding under its surface. When you reach the end of the game, you're booted back to the main menu, and for the average player, this is where the time will end with its deals. However, for those that are perceptive, you might have noticed the stars towards the bottom left of the screen. One will appear each time you complete one of the main game modes, and a total of five will be visible after all modes have been completed. But whether through curiosity or accident, if you hover your mouse over top of the stars, you may notice something. A 
a sound effect plays that is identical to the ones that can be heard when hovering over clickable options on the main menu, and by clicking the first star, you'll have entered the next phase of its deals. Each of the first three stars is linked to an extra mode, and this mode acts as a harder variant for the modes you've experienced during the base game, with the first extra game mode being a harder version of classic mode, titled The Labyrinth. Unlike the first portion of the game, you'll see something major as soon as you load in. You're actually able to see the sky, and sunlight beams down into the maze. And when checking the radar, the game shows you an extremely clear view of the area you're in. Now, this might cause players to have a false sense of security, but as the beginning dialogue states, you need to run. <laughs> Legs is back, but he's far faster than he was in his previous mode, and he's far more aggressive. You may also notice that the orbs have drastically increased in number, and the maze has drastically increased in size when compared to classic mode. And due to the size of this stage, it only adds to the increased threat of Legs, as now he has a plethora of options to approach you, and every corner and every turn is a risk. You may also begin to notice that the daylight that's flooding the maze is actually fading, and though you don't know it at the time, this is actually an indication of a time limit. Now, you do have a perk in this level, as you can actually run freely with no issue. This means you'll be sprinting all around the map while utilizing every skill you picked up in classic mode. When you hear it approach, hug the nearest corner and wait till you can flash him. After enough flashes, he'll become enraged just like before, but he's far faster than he ever has been, so cutting corners and staying mobile is your only chance. Just like always, of course, you'll inevitably grab your final orb. Unlike in all the previous modes up to this point, there's no ending. It just abruptly stops. And it does feel somewhat anticlimactic. And yet, you seem enticed to find other modes hidden among the stars. Shutter Mode is the second of the hidden game modes. And in this mode, it's in the same style as the previous of the Labyrinth where it features you being outside, with the light from the sky filling the halls below. And with its name, it's pretty easy to guess that Shutter Mode is the harder version of Shutter Mode. Also, like the previous mode, where the sunlight was actually an indication of a time limit, the same thing is involved here, as it will slowly get darker over time, and this means that there's a time limit involved, and the longer you take, the bigger risk there is for death. The mechanics and the objectives stay the same. Flash legs when needed, save battery life, and stay mobile. Legs, like in the previous mode, has increased speed and is far more aggressive than before, but he won't become enraged when you run, so you can dash through the stage freely. Luckily, the same strategy to beat Shutter Mode can be used in Shudder Mode. Hug corners, wait till you hear him approach, and then flash him when able. Keep track of your orb locations, and eventually, you'll grab the final orb and an ending sequence will play. But something feels... off. This is the true final mode in its deals, a mode called Junkyard. This is the most open area that we've seen throughout the entire game, and as the beginning instructions will inform you, this is hide and seek all over again. However, where the original hide and seek mode had tight corridors, small areas to work in, and darkened halls that you had to travel through, the Junkyard is the complete opposite, with large open spaces to travel in, orbs all over the place to collect, and the entire space is filled with light, so you can see pretty much everything, and a flashlight isn't needed. But you shouldn't get too comfortable, as the Hide and Seeker can move everywhere. Behind crates, around corners, or right in front of your path, the Hide and Seeker will do everything it can to become spotted. But in an odd way, this is actually the easiest and most lax mode of the game. You have so much room to move around, you can pretty much see anywhere, and the lighting in the zone is almost calming in an odd way. With the only threat being the Hide and Seeker becoming spotted, taking your time will almost guarantee a clean victory. At this point, the game is being rather tamed than before. <laughs> the stark contrast of being the Seeker and the Hider is intense here. Where being the Seeker gives you complete control over the environment, and the actual fear is pretty much moot, 
Finding the entity and playing his game will see it steals rip that security away. You can see the seeker move erratically, with a hellish red light emanating from his body. And no matter where you hide, no matter how good of a spot you pick, it'll always seem like he's able to gravitate towards you. And inevitably, he'll find you. And then, the game returns control to you. But it doesn't feel the same way now. You become uneasy at the simple fact that a single slip-up can see you becoming the one that must hide all over again. But, as long as you take your time, watch your peripheral vision, and move methodically through this stage, you can eventually clear out the area without any consequence. And once you finally collect your final orb, oddly enough, you're just booted back to the main screen. There's no ending, no final hoorah, no credits, no nothing, it just ends. But the first time the game did this to you, there was more to be found. The three hidden game modes are proof of that. So maybe, just maybe, there is more to It Steals that is yet to be found. If you begin to dig into the files or the community of It Steals, you may come across a few things of interest. One of the most popular hidden details is the existence of the Secret Spider. The Secret Spider is a mysterious entity with checkered skin that can only be found in the hide and seek game mode. This creature has an extremely low spawn rate, and it can take hours to get some good RNG and get it to spawn. Now luckily, the spider has been caught on a few recordings, and those recordings have been posted online, but what they show is some disturbing mechanics from the spider. The spider is faster than the player's base walking speed, and it will always stick to the ceiling while it chases you. And to make things worse, it's always aware of your location, so no matter where you go, the spider will find you. And it's also the only creature in the game with an actual jump scare animation, and one touch from it means game over. Its true purpose for being in the game is completely unknown, and information on the spider is extremely sparse. But surprisingly, the spider isn't the only entity with a mystery surrounding it. In Living Halls, if you have the ability to go out of bounds, you can find a creature with a terrifying screech that shares animations with the Phantom. This being is called the Freak. It has red checkered skin, dwarf teeth, and a distorted body. Not much is truly known about this creature, and in fact, most information is extremely sparse. The only reliable source of information I could find was from another fellow creator on YouTube. He was able to bring the entity into a playable map, and gave it working animations. He describes the Freak's function as somewhat of an in-game manager, as it controls certain events that you experience throughout its steals. Which leaves a very large question in the air. Why did the developer go through so much trouble of creating a unique creature with unique sound effects to solely be an in-game manager? Of course, it could just be leftovers from a scrapped game mode, and or it could very well be possible that the Freak is actually the Phantom's true form, since they both share animations. But I sadly couldn't get any confirmation from Zekers himself, so all of this is just purely conjecture, without having Zeker give a direct statement on it. Now aside from these unknown creatures, there are also other more tame but equally disturbing elements to its deals that no one seems to focus on. Like notes spread across the walls, all with writing that somewhat is similar to Doctor's handwriting. You can also find smiling faces painted onto the maze, blood smeared across the floor, and music becoming more distorted and deafened each time you change game modes. But the best example of these more obscure details that no one seems to notice are the doors. Every door in the game stays shut, and all the player can do to them is knock on them. The function seems to serve no purpose, or at least none that has been discovered as of yet. But as you approach each door, you might hear something that seems... odd. <laughs>
these sounds all hint to one thing. That there's something behind these locked doors and these deafened walls that we've yet to encounter. Out of every question and mystery It Steals presents, there is one that is far bigger than the rest. What is the story behind the horror? What is the lore of It Steals, if there is any? Now, if you go online and ask that question to anyone, people normally describe this game as one that mainly focuses on its gameplay and mechanics and nothing more. However, with the slew of details in this game, I find it hard to believe that there's nothing here, that there is no story, or at least some idea of a narrative. In fact, I went as far as to try and contact Zekers himself, but sadly, I was never able to get any sort of reply. So I ended up digging through all the old replies on the server where I found the info on Freak, but ended up finding conflicting information. Some said there was no story, some said the story was connected to other games that Zeker made, but nothing was concrete. That was until I found the holy grail of confirmation. When searching for keywords in the server, towards the very end of the list, you can find two separate replies from Zekers that hints at a story, and that story is 100% a secret. This is what I needed to find, so I went to work. I played the game for hours on end, trying to scrounge up any details I could find, and through all my research, I've come up with and found several possible theories on the underlining story of its deals. But first, we need to establish a few things. One, the orbs have some kind of significance in the game. Not only are they the main collectible, but since they refill your batteries and the camera, they might actually be a power source. Two. The game will drop clues and other information onto the loading bar, which hints at several possibilities. 3. Man-made structures litter the insides of the maze, vaults, bookshelves, and other random items, and this clearly hints at human involvement in some fashion. You can even find notes on the walls that we mentioned previously that are near impossible to make out. Now, of course, if you're a pleb like me, you can disable the pixelization and try and read the notes, but the developer left a cheeky note for anyone that tries to attempt this, so it really won't help us. 4. The kill screens hint at some form of intelligence of the creatures, as each kill screen seems to be them directly talking to the player that they just killed. And finally, 5. The game directly mentions in the loading bar that there was an old labyrinth that was abandoned, and this old labyrinth is where the extra game modes take place. Now, please keep in mind that these are all just theories. None of this is set in stone, and I was never able to get any true confirmation from the developer himself. So, take everything that I'm about to say with a maze worth of salt. Now, with that said, let's go ahead and dive into these theories. Theory 1. It's all in the head. As a very popular YouTuber, and one that I very much take a lot of inspiration from may say, this game may take place all in Lay Head. This is probably the weakest, and in my opinion, most boring idea of what the story behind It Steals could be. The creatures inside the labyrinth could very well just be inner demons that the player has to face, and the replayability of the game could actually be telling a narrative of you having to relive the cycle of torment time and time again. Another possible hint at this idea is that one of the loading bar notes states that you see checkers under your eyelids, and we've seen that every entity in the game that has checkered skin is obviously connected to the maze in some way, so maybe seeing checkers under your eyelids could possibly mean that you are connected to the maze in some way, maybe because the maze is kind of your own hell. But that's kind of where a lot of the evidence dies for this theory, as a lot of the other loading bar notes act as counterpoints to this idea. For example, they talk about abandoning an old labyrinth, so if this is all in your head, why would they need to talk about abandoning a labyrinth? This also doesn't explain the orbs, it doesn't explain any of the human-made structures. There just isn't enough here to, for me to really buy into the whole in-lay-head idea. Theory 2. Man-made facility that had to be abandoned. So this line of thinking somewhat follows the whole idea of the SCP Foundation. They're not related, I'm just using that as an example. The maze was constructed to contain these entities so they couldn't escape. They called this facility the Labyrinth, 
and there was an original version of this building constructed before, which is now known as the Old Labyrinth, which they ended up abandoning, and we know this because of the loading bar note. This can actually help explain why there are random crates and bookshelves and vault doors all put here, as they were all brought into the Labyrinth for whatever purpose, maybe possibly studying these entities before things went south. Now, a common theory is that legs in the Hide and Seeker from the main game modes are different than the ones found in the extra game modes, as their sound effects are somewhat different, and the ones found in the extra game mode are far more aggressive and almost insane. So it's possible that the original version of Legs, the one that they captured or stored here, became so dangerous and powerful that they had to abandon this old labyrinth and construct a new one where another version of Legs was kept. This can also explain all the random notes scattered around the place. Maybe these notes were actually research papers on what they were finding out on the entities. And obviously, now as the players in this area, there is no signs of life. The only signs that there was life was the blood splattered walls and the blood stains smeared across the floor. Very well meaning that something went wrong. It's possible that the entities actually ended up breaking containment in the labyrinth and they roam free. So the second labyrinth was completely abandoned. Now this doesn't explain the orbs at all. Like if this was a man-made facility, why are the orbs here? Are they abandoned power cells from the group that used to be here? We don't know. But I do think it's one of the strongest theories for sure of what It Seals' story could be. However, I think the third theory is most likely the strongest. Theory 3, the maze is alive. This theory acts as a bit of a modified version of the second theory. However, instead of the labyrinth being constructed by humans, the labyrinth itself is an entity. It is alive. One of the best possible pieces of evidence towards this idea is that every creature in some fashion has a direct physical connection in style to the maze itself. The maze also has fake walls which can be opened once approached, and a menacing laugh can be heard when passing through them. <laughs> now it could be possible that this laugh is associated with the creatures, but the sound effect that plays doesn't sound at all similar to them, and if it's not related to the entity, then the only thing it could be is the maze itself. Now another big piece of evidence is another loading bar note, which states, it likes spectators. Now this loading bar note can be seen no matter what game mode you select, so there's no real way to tell what it is, unless the note is actually referring to the entirety of the maze, that the maze itself likes spectators. Now you're probably asking yourself, if the maze is alive, then why is there stuff inside of there that's obviously man-made? And that is a very good question to ask. We obviously can't ignore any of the evidence that we found during the first and the second theory. And I don't intend to. In fact, this actually makes a lot of sense. If the maze is alive, it could very well be possible that a group of people or an organization discovered the maze and what it was, and that they decided to actually investigate inside of it. Now, do you remember when I mentioned how the orbs were actually a possible power source? Well, there is no explanation where they could come from or why we're supposed to collect them. But what if the orbs were actually a byproduct of the maze itself? And that's what intrigued the organization that found the maze. They first set up shop in an older portion of the maze's body, the old labyrinth. But the entities there became so powerful that there was no way to contain them, so they abandoned that portion. Delving deeper into the maze, they started to build vaults to protect themselves. These vaults can be seen in the Living Halls map, but through trickery from the monstrosities, no one was able to stay safe, and the containment was inevitably breached. Each entity and creature that resides in the maze is actually a defense of the maze. It's part of the maze. They're all one creature just with different attributes. And eventually, the maze was able to push out the interlopers, the only thing remaining from the humans being the things they left behind, like their furniture and the vaults that they used to try and protect themselves while inside the labyrinth. And then that only leaves the protagonist. The protagonist is an interesting case, as we don't have any kind of story backing up where they're from or what they're doing here. Or do we? The title of the game is called It Steals. Now, when trying to apply that title as a descriptor for the game, it doesn't really make sense. 
legs, the hide and seeker, the phantom, the monstrosities, freak, the spider, none of them steal anything. And if this theory is right and the maze is alive, the maze isn't stealing anything either. But if we follow the line of thinking that we establish in this theory, and the orbs are some sort of byproduct from the maze itself, then when it says it steals, it's referring to you, the player. You're stealing from the labyrinth. If the reason that there was human intervention inside the maze was because of collecting this byproduct off the maze, the blue orbs that seem to emit energy, what if you are a member of that organization? You were sent into the maze after containment was broken, and all of the humans either evacuated or died. And your mission was to steal and retrieve as many orbs as possible. Now you might be thinking there isn't any evidence to this, but I would beg to differ. In every game mode, the player always has equipment that they need in order to engage the entities in the zone. For example, during the Phantom area, you're given two special high-tech devices that are the only thing possible that can deter the Phantom. In the Living Halls level, you're given a device that can detect the monstrosities that also features a timer which is already preset to when the monstrosities become fully active and it becomes unsafe to traverse the maze. And in every game mode, you're equipped with the radar, a radar that seems to be specifically designed to detect light. And the main thing that shows up on this radar is the same light blue orbs you need to collect. This all leads to too many things running together. And now with all this laid out, the title of the game makes that much more sense, and it doesn't seem all that far-fetched anymore. The story of its steals is one about a corporation that discovers a living labyrinth. This mass entity, in one way or another, creates a byproduct of energy in the form of these blue orbs. And this object becomes a great source of interest to the corporation. They first try and enter the labyrinth through the older sections of its body, as it's the only space where the body is exposed to the sky allowing for easy access. After the corporation enters the body of the entity, they begin to set up shop, researching the creature and all of its different zones. In retaliation, the May spawns extensions of itself, guardians of sorts, that are designed to protect it from interlopers. Because of these guardians, the corporation begins putting countermeasures in place to deal with them, constructing vaults and other devices that can protect anyone entering the maze. However, these measures were not enough as eventually the maze's guardians were able to break containment, and they began to slaughter the researchers and workers of the corporation. Due to this failure, the corporation began attempting a new tactic. In order to minimize the chance of another mass slaughter, they used the research that they accumulated and the devices they constructed as armaments for a single person. And that person is you. You are told to enter the maze alone with a simple mission. Collect as many orbs as possible, steal from the maze, and survive while doing so. But as we know from the end of the game, your mission is a failure. And this whole idea of sending a single person in only to die is strengthened in one of the loading bar notes. Meaning that every time you play, it's another person entering the maze with the same mission. And that their fate will be one that leads to death. It Steals is a game that leaves me with a very odd sensation. After becoming so accustomed to its mechanics as well as its underlining story and the entities that lie within the halls, I still find myself becoming scared and anxious every time I load it up. The fact that no matter how good I get at this game and no matter how many times I play through it, I always start feeling excited only to soon after have those same feelings replaced with ones of anxiety and dread. Even doing this deep dive and replaying the game for footage, I still ended up getting jumped. I continuously rechecked corners and feeling uneasy about the moves that I was making, and that says a lot about what It Steals has to offer. This experience is a true testament to what every horror game should strive to be. It's aesthetically unique, it has mechanics that are executed perfectly, each mode offers a variety of creatures and mechanics for the player to adapt to, while also making those entities and mechanics not overstay their welcome. And finally, it still has plenty of mysteries to solve, and it only entices me to investigate more into it. And thanks to its replayability, I'll always end up coming back It Steals again and again and again, anytime I want a good scare, or if I just want to play the game for a challenge. Now, yes, It Steals is a very short experience. On a blind run, it might take you two to three hours to fully beat it, and on repeat runs, you'll probably be able to get it through in about an hour or less. But honestly, I don't think the length truly matters here. It Steals keeps you guessing from start to finish, even with its short runtime, and it will for sure leave you with a bigger impact than almost any other title in the genre. And for that, and many other reasons why, It Steals is a perfect example of a horror game 
done with.